Hello everybody, Jade Hamilton here and because it's getting so near to Christmas I thought I'd give you a Christmas treat. It's not Christmas themed but it is a story about family and about love and about redemption and about miracles. Um, any Royal Dar fans in the audience are probably way ahead of me. I'm talking about Matilda. Matilda's a story I've loved since I was five years old and I wanted to share it with you because it is a you know it's a story that is a huge part of my childhood really. Um <clears throat> I've got my little Lucy Camille with me, who is in this beautiful Evan Co romper with buttons at the back, and a little bib, and a bib that says, I really love you, because Lucy loves animals. This romper has got a wonderful monkey with a flower in her hair on the front. What's that, Lucy? She looks like Mo from the... Oh, yes, she does. You're right. She looks like Mo from Tia Mo, doesn't she? That's quite cool, isn't it? And Lucy has decided to pair this ensemble with her football boots because of reasons. She loves her footy boots, so... I thought we'd we'd pair them with those. Pair it with those, sorry. Now, grab a hot drink if you've got one, sit back, relax, and enjoy the story. As per all the videos where I read, um, I own absolutely nothing. All copyright goes to Roald Dahl, Quentin Blake, and Puffin. Um, this is for enjoyment only. Righty ho. Let's start with chapter one, which is called The Reader of Books. It's a funny thing about parents. Even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister you could ever imagine, they still think they're wonderful. Some parents go further. They become so blinded by adoration, they manage to convince themselves their quiet child has qualities of genius. Well, there's nothing very wrong with all this. It's the way of the world. It's only when the parents begin telling us about the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we start shouting, Bring us a base and we're going to be sick! School teachers suffer a good deal from having to listen to this sort of twaddle from proud parents, but they usually get their own back when the time comes to write the end of term reports. If I were a teacher, I'd cook up some real scorches for the children of doting parents. Your son, Maximilian, I would write, is a total washout. I hope you have a family business you can push him into when he leaves school because he sure as heck won't get a job anywhere else. Or if I was feeling lyrical that day, I might, or if I were feeling lyrical that day, sorry, I might write, it is a curious truth that grasshoppers have their hearing organs in the sides of the abdomen. Judging by what your daughter Vanessa has learnt this term, this fact alone is more interesting than anything I have taught in the classroom. I might even delve deeper into natural history and say, the periodical cicada spends six years as a grub underground and no more than six days as a free creature of sunlight. There, your son Wilfred 
has spent six years as a grub in this school and we are still waiting for him to emerge from the chrysalis. A particularly poisonous little girl might sting me into saying, Fiona has the same glacial beauty as an iceberg, but unlike the iceberg, she has absolutely nothing below the surface. I think I might enjoy writing end-of-term reports for the stinkers in my class. But enough of that. We have to get on. Occasionally, one comes across parents who take the opposite line, who show no interest at all in their children. And these, of course, are far worse than the doting ones. Mr and Mrs Wormwood were two such parents. They had a son called Michael and a daughter called Matilda. And the parents looked upon Matilda in particular as nothing more than a scab. A scab is something you have to put up with until the time comes when you can pick it off and flick it away. Mr and Mrs Mer Wormwood Looked forward enormously to the time when they could pick their little daughter off and flick her away. Mm. 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 <sighs> Excuse me, folks. Mm. Mm. Quick little coffee break. There we go. Preferably into the next county. Or even further than that. It is bad enough when parents treat ordinary children as though they were scabs and bunions. But it becomes somehow a lot worse when the child in question is extraordinary. And by that I mean sensitive and brilliant. Matilda was both of these things, but above all, she was brilliant. Her mind was so nimble and she was so quick to learn that her ability should have been obvious, even to the most half-witted of parents. But Mr and Mrs Wormwood were both so gormless and so wrapped up in their own silly little lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. To tell the truth, I doubt they'd have noticed had she crawled into the house with a broken leg. Matilda's brother Michael was a perfectly average boy, but the sister, as I've said, was something to make your eyes pop. By the age of one and a half, her speech was perfect, and she knew as many words as most grown-ups. The parents, instead of applauding her, called her a noisy chatterbox and told her sharply that small girls should be seen and not heard. By the time she was three, Matilda had taught herself to read by studying newspapers and magazines that lay around the house. At the age of four, she could read fast and well and she naturally began hankering after books. The only book in the whole of this enlightened household was something called Easy Cooking, belonging to her mother. And when she'd read this from cover to cover and learnt all the recipes by heart, she decided she wanted something more interesting. Daddy, she said, do you think you could buy me a book? A book, he said. What do you want a flaming book for? To read, Daddy. What's wrong with the telly, for sake? You've got a lovely telly with its 12-inch screen. And now you come asking for a book? You're getting spoilt, my girl. Sorry, we've got a lovely telly with a 12-inch screen. Nearly every weekday afternoon, Matilda was left alone in the house. Her brother five years older than her, went to school, her father went to work and her mother went out playing bingo in a town eight miles away. Mrs Wormwood was hooked on bingo 
and played it five afternoons a week. On the afternoon of the day her father had refused to buy her a book, Matilda set out all by herself to walk to the public library in the village. When she arrived, she introduced herself to the librarian, Mrs Phelps. She asked if she might sit at a little while and read a book. Mrs Phelps, slightly taken aback at the arrival of such a tiny girl, unaccompanied by an adult, nevertheless told her she was very welcome. Where are the children's books, please? Matilda asked. They're over, they're over there on those lower shelves, Mrs Phelps told her. Would you like me to help you find a good one with lots of pictures in it? No, thank you, Matilda said. I'm sure I can manage. From then on, every afternoon, as soon as her mother had left for bingo, Matilda would toddle down to the library. The walk took only ten minutes and this allowed her two glorious hours, sitting quietly by herself in a cosy corner, devouring one book after another. When she'd read every single children's book in the place, she started wandering round in search of something else. Mrs Phelps, who'd been watching her with fascination for the past few weeks, now got up from her desk and went over to, went over to her. Can I can I help you, Matilda? She asked. I'm wondering what to read next, Matilda said. I've finished all the children's books. You mean you've looked at the pictures? Yes, but I've read the books as well. Mrs Phelps looked down at Matilda from her great height. And Matilda looked right back up at her. I thought some were very poor. Matilda said the others were lovely. I liked the secret garden best of all. It was full of mystery. The mystery of the room behind the closed door and the mystery of the garden behind the big wall. Mrs Phelps was stunned. Exactly how old are you, Matilda? She asked. Four years and three months, Matilda said. Mrs Phelps was more stunned than ever, but she had the sense not to show it. What sort of a book would you like to read next? she asked. Matilda said, I would like a really good one that grown-ups read. A famous one. I don't know any names. Mrs Phelps looked along the shelves, taking her time. She didn't quite know what to bring out. How, she asked herself, does one choose a famous grown-up book for a four-year-old girl? Her first thought was to pick a young teenager's romance of the kind that's written for 15-year-olds, but for some reason, she found herself instinctively walking past that particular shelf. Try this, she said at last. It's very famous and very good. If it's too long for you, just let me know and I'll find something shorter and a bit easier. Great Expectations, Matilda read, by Charles Dickens. I'd love to try it. What am I thinking? Mrs Phelps asked herself, but to Matilda she said, Of course you may try it. Over the next few afternoons, Mrs Phelps could hardly take her eyes from the small girl sitting hour after hour in the big armchair at the far end of the room with the book on her lap. It was necessary to rest it on the lap because it was too heavy for her to hold up which meant she had to sit leaning forward in order to read. And a strange sight it was, this tiny, dark-haired person sitting there with her feet nowhere near touching the floor, totally absorbed 
in the wonderful adventures of Pip and old Miss Havisham and her cobweb house, and by the spell of magic that Dickens, the great storyteller, had woven with his words. The only movement from the reader was the lifting of the hand every now and then to turn a pa over a page. And Mrs. Phelps always felt sad when the time came for her to cross the floor and say, It's ten to five, Matilda. During the first week of Matilda's visit, Mrs. Phelps had said to her, Does your mother walk you down here every day and take you home? My mother goes to Aylesbury every afternoon to play bingo, Matilda had said. She doesn't know I come here. But that's surely not right, Mrs Phelps said. I think you'd better ask her. I'd rather not, Matilda said. She doesn't encourage reading books, nor does my father. But what do they expect you to do every afternoon in an empty house? Just mooch around, watch the telly? I see. She doesn't really care what I do, Matilda said a little sadly. Mrs Phelps was concerned about the child's safety on the walk through the fairly busy village high street and the crossing of the road but she decided not to interfere. Within a week, Matilda had finished Great Expectations, which in that edition contained 411 pages. I loved it, she said to Mrs Phelps. Has Mr Dickens written any others? A great number, said the astounded Mrs Phelps. Shall I choose you another? Over the next six months, under Mrs Phelps's watchful and compassionate eye, Matilda read the following books. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy, Gone to, no Gone to Earth excuse me, by Mary Webb, Kim by Rudyard Kipling, The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells, The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway, The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck, The Good Companions by J.B. Priestley, Brighton Rock by Graham Greene, an Animal Farm by George Orwell. It was a formidable list, and by now Mrs Phelps was filled with wonder and excitement, but it was probably a good thing that she did not allow herself to be completely carried away by it all. Almost anyone else witnessing the achievements of this small child would have been tempted to make a great fuss and shout the news all over the village, but the village and beyond, but not so Mrs Phelps. She was someone who minded her own business and had long since discovered it was seldom worthwhile to interfere with other people's children. Mr Hemingway says a lot of things I don't understand, Matilda said to her, especially about men and women, but I loved it all the same. The way he tells it, I feel I'm right there on the spot, watching it all happen. A fine narrator will always make you feel that, Mrs Phelps said. And don't worry about the bits you can't understand. Sit back and allow the words to wash around you, like music. I will, I will. Did you know? Did you know? Mrs Phelps said, that public libraries like this allow you to borrow books and take them home. I didn't know that, Matilda said. Could I do it? Of course, said Mrs, Mrs Phelps said. When you have chosen the book you want, bring it to me so I can make a note of it, and it's yours 
for two weeks. You can take more than one if you wish. From then on, Matilda would visit the library only once a week in order to take out new books and return the old ones. Her own small bedroom now became her reading room and there she would sit and read most afternoons, often with a mug of hot chocolate beside her. She was not quite tall enough to reach things around the kitchen, but she kept a small box in the outhouse which she brought in and stood on in order to get whatever she wanted. Mostly it was hot chocolate she made, warming the milk in a saucepan on the stove before mixing it. Occasionally she made bovril or ovaltine. It was pleasant to take a hot drink up to her room and have it beside her as she sat in her silent room reading in the empty house in the afternoons. The books transported her into new worlds and introduced her to amazing people. She went to 19th century estates with Jane Austen. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway and to California with John Steinbeck. She travelled all over the world while sitting in her little room in an English village. Chapter 2. Mr Wormwood, the Great Car Dealer Matilda's parents owned quite a nice house with three bedrooms upstairs. While well, on the ground, with three bedrooms upstairs. While well, on the ground floor, there was a dining room and a living room and a kitchen. Her father was a dealer in second-hand cars, and it seemed he did pretty well at it. Sawdust, he would say proudly, is one of the great secrets of my success, and it costs me nothing. I get it free from the sawmill. What do you use it for? Matilda asked him. Ha! the father said. Wouldn't you like to know? I don't see how sawdust can help you sell second-hand cars, Daddy. That's because you're an ignorant little twit, the father said. His speech was never very delicate, but Matilda was used to it. She also knew that he liked to boast and she would egg him on shamelessly. You must be very clever to find a use for something that costs nothing, she said. I wish I could do it. You couldn't, the father said. You're too stupid. But I wouldn't mind telling young Mike here about it, seeing as he'll be joining me in the business one day. Ignoring Matilda, he turned to his son and said, I'm always glad to buy a car when some fool has been crashing the gears so badly they're all run out and rattle like mad. I get it cheap. Then all I do is mix a bit, a lot of sawdust in with the oil in the gearbox and it runs as sweet as a nut. How long will it run like that before it starts rattling again? Matilda asked him. Long enough for the buyer to get a good distance away, the father said, grinning. About a hundred miles? But that's dishonest, Daddy, Matilda said. It's cheating. No one ever got rich being honest, the father said. Customers are there to be diddled. Mr Wormwood was a small, ratty-looking man whose front teeth stuck out underneath a thin, ratty moustache. He liked to wear jackets with large, brightly coloured checks and sported ties that were usually yellow or pale green. Mm. Sorry, excuse me. I shouldn't talk with that awful. Now take mileage, for instance, he went on. Anyone who's buying a second-hand car, the first thing he wants to know is how many miles is done, right? Right, the son said. So I buy an old dump 
that's got about 150,000 miles on the clock. I get it cheap. But no one's going to buy it with a mileage like that, are they? And these days, you can't just take the speedometer out and fiddle all the numbers back like you used to 10 years ago. They fixed it, so it's impossible to tamper with it unless you're a running watchmaker or something. So what do I do? I use my brains, laddie. That's what I do. How? Young Michael asked, fascinated. He seemed to in have inherited his father's love of cookery. I sit down and I say to myself, how can I convert a mileage reading of 150,000 into only 10,000 without taking the speedometer to pieces? Well, if I were to run the car backwards for long enough, then obviously that would do it. The numbers would click backwards, wouldn't they? But who's going to drive a flaming car in reverse for thousands and thousands of miles? You couldn't do it. Of course you couldn't, young Michael said. So I scratched my head. The father said, I use my brains. When you've got, been given a fine brain like I am, you've got to use it. And all of a sudden, the answer hits me. I tell you, I felt exactly like that other brilliant fella must have felt when he discovered penicillin. Eureka! I cried, I've got it! What did you do, Dad? Son asked him. The speedometer, Mr Wormwood said, is run off a cable that's coupled up to one of the front wheels. So first... I disconnect the cable where it joins the front wheel. Next, I get one of those high-speed electric drills and I couple that up to the end of the cable in such a way that when the drill turns, it turns the cable backwards. You with me so you got me so far? You following me? Yes, Daddy. Michael said. These drills run at a tremendous speed, the father said. So when I switch the drill on, the mileage numbers on the speedo spin backwards at a fantastic rate. I can knock 50,000 miles off the clock in a few minutes with my high speed electric drill. And by the time I've finished, the car's only done 10,000. And it's ready for sale. She's almost new, I say to the customer. She's hardly done 10,000. Belonged to a lady who only used it once a week for shopping. Can you really turn the mileage back with an electric drill? Michael, young Michael asked. I'm telling you, trade secrets, the father said. So don't you go talking about this to anyone else. You don't want me put in jail, do you? I won't tell a soul, the boy said. Do you do this to many cars, Dad? Every single car that comes through my hands gets the treatment, the father said. They all have their mileage cut to under 10,000 before they're offered for sale. And to think I invented that all by myself, he added proudly. It's made me a mint. Matilda, who had been listening closely, said, But, Daddy, that's even more dishonest than the sawdust. You're cheating people. Dishonest than the sawdust. It's disgusting. You're cheating people who trust you. If you don't like it, then don't eat the food in this house. The father said, It's bought with the profits. It's dirty money, Matilda said. I hate it. Two red spots appeared on the father's cheeks. Who the heck do you think you are? He shouted. The Archbishop of Canterbury or something preaching to me about honesty. You're just an ignorant little squirt who hasn't the foggiest idea what you're talking about. Quite right, Harry, the mother said. And to Matilda she said, 
You've got a nerve talking to your father like that. Now keep your nasty mouth shut so we can all watch this programme in peace. They were on the living, in the living room, eating their suppers on their knees in front of the telly. The suppers were TV dinners in floppy aluminium containers with separate compartments for the stewed meat, boiled, the boiled potatoes and the peas. Mrs Wormwood sat munching her meal with her eyes glued to the American soap opera on the screen. She was a large woman whose hair, who wore heavy makeup and whose hair was dyed platinum blonde, except where you could see the mousy brown bits growing out from the roots. Mummy, Mummy, Matilda said, would you mind if I ate my supper in the dining room so I could read my book? The father glanced up sharply. I would mind, he snapped. Supper is a family gathering and no one leaves the table till it's over. But we're not at the table, Matilda said. We never are. We're always eating off our knees and watching the telly. What's wrong with watching the telly, may I ask? The father said. His voice had suddenly become soft and dangerous. Matilda didn't trust herself to answer him, so she kept quiet. She could feel the anger boiling up inside her. She knew it was wrong to hate her parents like this, but she was finding it very hard not to do so. All the reading she had done had given her a view of life that they had never seen. If only they would read a little Dickens or Austin, they would soon discover there was more to life than cheating people and watching television. Another thing, she resented being told constantly that she was ignorant and stupid when she knew she wasn't. The anger inside her went on boiling and boiling, and as she lay in bed that night, she made a decision. She decided that every time her father or her mother was beastly to her, she would get her own back in some way. A small victory or two would help her tolerate their, their nastiness and stop her from doing anything more drastic. You must remember that she was still hardly five years old and it's not, a, and it's not easy for, any, for somebody as small as that to score points against an all-powerful grown-up. Even so, she was determined to have a go. Her father, after what had happened in front of the telly that evening, was first on her list. Ooh, sounds like Matilda's dad's going to get a bit of a shock coming to him. We'll have to see what happens. <clears throat> And on that note, that's it for now, because um, I'm running short on time. Um, I will continue this story over the next few days, because I'm, I'm going to have it as a sort of a, a Christmas reading special. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, commenting. It really makes my day when you do. And I will see you all again very, very soon. Can you wave, Lucy? Good girl. Cheerio, everybody. Bye-bye.